Hi everyone, this is Sherry Martin. I'm President and CEO of the Cobb Community Foundation and welcome to our third 45 on Friday. Our last 45 on Friday was three weeks ago and a lot has certainly happened since then. Um, let me just say that like you, we are saddened, we are horrified, and we are also angry but we also know that we need to be a part of the solution. And as a community foundation, that's what we're charged to do. So just know that we pledge to be part of the solution to improve the situation that we're now facing uh, in our country. Um, and I wanna share with you a quote that someone shared with me. Uh, she said, I don't know what to do. I don't have a lot that I can do, but what I can do is feed people. And I will do that with all I have. And I hope she's on the call to hear that because I just thought that was a wonderful way to look at things. So last week, uh, we had Howard Kepke on our call and we talked quite a bit about all that's going on in the food arena in Cobb County and how all the nonprofits are, work together, are working together. In just a few minutes, you're gonna hear from uh, some folks that you like I know and love and hear what they are doing to feed children uh, throughout the summer. But first, let me give you just a few updates. You know, we always talk about our three hats, the community catalyst hat, the grant maker hat, the charitable fund manager. And within that catalyst hat, I hope you all saw uh, the article that was in the MDJ. I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday but they just did a great job talking about Cobb Community Food Fleet. And with Cobb Community Food Fleet, the Braves are allowing us to use their stadium and their walk-in refrigerator that is larger than my entire house to store food that is coming in from multiple places where we are helping the farmers because they are selling their food through the, one of the USDA programs. They have to get it delivered, but no single nonprofit in Cobb County can house all of the food that can come in. So the Braves stepped up. They said, you can house it here. Um, we have trucks going in and out of there all the time. Athena Foods partnered with us. Uh, Kim Gresh and her team uh, helped us to secure a, a freezer trailer, a 53 foot freezer trailer. So we have a, a place to put the frozen food that comes in and the nonprofits are coming in and out and, and food is getting distributed all over. And we just couldn't be more pleased to be a part of that. So if you haven't seen that article, you'll see information on our blog as well as a link to the MDJ article. Um, one other thing that I'll mention is that the million dollars in food grants, uh, those were recommended officially yesterday uh, and the Board of Commissioners is voting on those on Tuesday. So that's going to be moving forward and we're going to get some money in the hands of the nonprofits because even though we've got lots of produce coming in and some dairy and uh, some meat as well, although that's really tough to come by, um, there are no dry goods to be found. So they're going to have to buy those. Um, so that money is going to come in handy. In the community cat, excuse me, in the grant maker role, um, I think you all know that we provided some stopgap grants to those um, food providers so that they would be able to help continue to feed the community and procure the food that they needed to distribute um, and would have to pay for before those uh, dollars came in. And then the last thing in working as a charitable fund manager, one of the things that we've been doing is encouraging um, our folks who have charitable funds with us, that when you're thinking about the giving that you're doing, think about what's going on in the community, the needs in the community, and what there is not already funding for. So for example, we have the million dollars that the county awarded for food, um, for the purchase of food, which is wonderful. We also have some food coming in, which is wonderful. What neither of those cover are that some of our nonprofits need more freezer space exactly where they are. Because even though we can store things for a longer period of time at the Brave Stadium, we still need to have 
uh, they still need to have a place where they can put that chicken or that pork or whatever until they're getting ready to distribute it. So that food truck or uh, box trucks, um, the, the kinds of things that they will need to be sure that um, food stays uh, food stays cold for even the short uh, distances. Those are the kinds of things that are still needed. So don't think that those organizations providing food don't need your help because they do. And there are a whole lot of other things, a lot of other ways that you can help as well. But let me go ahead and transition. And we're gonna start off with a poll. And before we take this poll, I need to define something because there's uh, gonna be um, a term used and that is food insecurity. And there are a lot of folks out there who hear that term, but they don't necessarily know what it means. But food insecurity is considered to be a state of where you do not have a dependable source of enough or the right kind of food to allow you to live a healthy lifestyle. It can be because you don't have the money to pay for the food. It can be because there aren't grocery stores anywhere near you. Um, there can be all kinds of reasons, but food insecurity is not having the access that you need to food. So with that, we're going to run a poll right now, and we're going to ask you a question, and let's, let's see how you guys do. So Cheryl, do we have it? So our poll, I'm not sure that it's working right now, or maybe I need to do it. I think Let's I see. saw a message uh, from Cheryl a moment ago asking you to do it. Thank you very much. I can't do two things at one time. That's, that, that's not fair. Okay, so I'm going to launch our poll. It just went out. Panelists, you are not allowed to answer because you know the answer. Okay, let's see. So our question is, we have 311 households in Cobb County. And the question is, how many of these households are estimated to be experiencing food insecurity? Okay, we see the numbers moving all over. Okay, I'm gonna give it just a second. 71% of you have voted. Let's make it 100, come on. 81%, we're almost there. Well, I will say that the single largest um, group of voters has it right. Okay, so we're going to end the poll, but let me tell you where we ended up. Um, and that is more than 40,000, 48% of you said more than 40,000. Um, 10 of you, 43% said 25 to 40,000, and 2 or 9% said 15,000 to 25,000. So the correct answer is option number four. Um, unfortunately, um, 42,000 households are food insecure. Um, that is an awful lot, 41,000 households. That's actually double of what those numbers were prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, if that gives you any idea of what, um, what we're facing and trying to make sure that folks are fed. So um, with that, let me introduce uh, our panel. Um, Ike Reigert is looking down at his keyboard. <laughs> oh, let me unmute you, Mike. Uh, or I think you'll need to unmute yourself. Um, so Ike is president and CEO right. of Must Ministries. He's also the senior pastor of Piedmont Church. And Must Ministries serves 30. 34,000 people a year who are struggling in poverty. Ike is also an author, husband, father, and grandfather. So thank you, Ike. Um, we're also, we also have with us Dr. Grant Rivera. Grant, wave your hand. So they know which person you are. <laughs> I, I want someone to mistake me for Ike Riker. So I- <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I'm me too, <laughs> me too. <laughs> Um, Grant Rivera is superintendent of Marietta City Schools, um, and Marietta City has 8,900 students and 1,900 employees. Um, 
Grant and his wife, Jen, have two girls, the oldest of whom attends Marietta City Schools. And I think I heard something about his playing with Ike's granddaughter from time to time at Camp Ike. <laughs> John Floresta is Chief Strategy and Accountability Officer uh, for Cobb County School District reporting directly to the superintendent. John leads communications and public relations events and accountability research and grants. Uh, Cobb County's enrollment, Cobb Schools enrollment, exceeds 113,000 students, making it the second largest public school system in Georgia and the 23rd largest in the country. Um, Rebecca, Becky, as we know and love her, Shipley is executive director of two YMCAs in Cobb County, McCleskey East Cobb Y and the Northeast Cobb Y. And she also has responsibilities for three other wives in Metro Atlanta. Becky is a wife and mother to two children, Sierra and Nate. And guess what? Before we jump in, we've got another poll because this one is going to uh, really tee up a question that we're gonna be asking to Grant and John. Okay, let's see. Oh, next, didn't do the right one. I got the wrong poll out there. Let's see if I can get it right. Well, I can't. So I'm going to go ahead and just tell you what this poll said. And that is, which of the following statements are not true? So just pretend that you're answering this poll. And again, no hints from the panelists. Uh, which of these is not true? Children from families with incomes at or below 130% of the poverty level are eligible for free meals at school. That is true. Children from families with incomes 130% to 185% of the poverty level are eligible for reduced price meals. That is also true. And by the way, uh, the poverty line for a family of four is about $25,000. Doesn't take much to get there at all. Think that's, that's what I made when I got out of college a long, long, long time ago. And that was just me. Um, number three, all children who qualify receive free or reduced lunch. Mm, that's a trick question because they can but their parents have to fill out a form. They have to self-identify. And the reason why that is important is that with the numbers that we have of children who are on free and reduced lunch, we think there are actually a lot more who qualify because many parents don't go through the process of filling out the paperwork for many, many reasons. So last one, approximately one third of all Cobb County and Marietta City students receive free or reduced lunch? That's also a trick question because yes, that's true, one third do, but also up to 50% also qualify to receive and receive free and reduced lunches, which means there are probably more children who qualify. Uh, you're gonna hear some staggering numbers uh, from both John and Grant. Um, so with that, let's get started. Um, and panelists, if you would unmute yourselves, I would appreciate it. All right, so of the four organizations represented here, folks, typically only one or two of you are thought of as food providers. We don't think of the schools as food providers. And Becky, many people don't think of the why as a food provider. Um, so without going yet into summer activities, because that's a whole subject into itself, and Grant, uh, or excuse me, John, let's start with you. Can you describe the food-related needs that have impacted your organization and how you've helped to address those during the pandemic. Yeah, I can, and, and you stole a little bit of my thunder. I'll probably repeat more poorly than you already stated some of the stats just so that those who are on the call get a sense for what needs look like before COVID-19 impacted our, our students and our families. But on any given day uh, prior to March 13th, our food and nutrition staff, who's led by Executive Director Emily Hamlin, served, of course, 113,000 kids a day. Some trivia for you next time that you're doing a poll on Zoom or around your kitchen table. 20,000 breakfasts and 85,000 lunches were served on a daily basis. 
on a yearly basis. That's about a million pounds of fresh vegetables and fruit, um, 750,000 gallons of milk. And you say, all right, that's a lot. We get it. It's a lot. And, and it is. It just says that, hey, on a daily basis, there are already a large number of students that, that had needs. And, and Sherry, you mentioned that in, uh, in great detail moments ago. But more importantly than the numbers, of course, is, is those kids. As you mentioned, uh, we know that 40% of the students, 41% of the students here in Cobb are on free and reduced lunch, but we know that the number is more than that. That's it's about 50,000 students here in Cobb. But if you just think about that again, that's 50,000 students and families whose main source of food is at a school. We also know um, for a whole variety of reasons that, that number is probably short of, of the real need. It takes a lot of courage to tell a teacher that your family needs help. It takes a lot of courage to tell a guidance counselor you don't know where your next meal is coming from. And so just as a baseline before COVID-19 um, changed these needs, we already had more needs than we had resources. And frankly, the only way we're able to meet those needs is through public private partnerships with organizations like Must Ministries and, and Ike, as well as many other organizations that I'll reference here shortly throughout Cobb County. But uh, to battle, to use that term, food insecurity throughout the day, um, it was already a big task. To battle food insecurity outside the day, prior to COVID-19, we had begun, uh, or we had continued these public-private partnerships I just mentioned. We had over 30 food pantries in partnership with Must Ministries located throughout our buildings. Uh, with the food supply provided by Must, with Must volunteers, so that food insecure students could also eat uh, when the cafeteria was not open. And so I say all that to say the needs prior to COVID-19 were already uh, very significant. We'll all remember, of course, where we were when you heard the, the, the news that school buildings were closed or closing, whether that was in Cobb County or in Marietta City. And uh, for us, that was on a Friday. We made an announcement and by Monday, our schools were closed. And by Monday, Emily Hamlin and her food and nutrition team were meeting what became daily um, or even multiple times a day with our social work team in the beginning of a, of a task force, if you will, a work group um, uh, was built, not just with internal staff, but also with our external partners to begin identifying what needs had changed for our students because our buildings had closed. And that's really where the conversation for us began after our buildings shut down. Hey, we are used to serving students in a particular way, we know those needs have changed, and for us to adapt to meet those needs, we have to understand what those needs uh, look like. And so, again, through a collaborative with our social work team, our food and nutrition team, uh, Must Ministries, the YMCA, Cobb Community Foundation, the Cobb Collaborative, many local churches, how do we tackle this problem? And I'll be honest with you, it, um, no easy answer. I'm not telling anybody on this call anything that they don't know. I'm not telling you that we had it all figured out, certainly not in the days um, after we closed. We did have a conviction, though, that we needed to serve our students' needs through, again, a private-public partnership. And during those first days, we opened 29 locations across the county and, uh, frankly, just said, hey, listen, we don't know how this is going to work. We don't know uh, where the food's coming from. We just know we have to serve our kids. And over the course of that first week, going into the second, um, we, we listened. We listened to a lot of the experts, many of whom were probably on this call. Um, and we said, hey, listen, we are not food distribution experts, uh, at least not outside of the four walls or outside of a cafeteria, and we need to learn from you. And, and we did. And through that, we've been able to serve uh, over 350,000 meals between March 16th and the last day of school. And uh, again, that's a testament really to the partnerships and the community that we have here many of whom are on this call, and so we'll thank you for it. I'll tell you a little bit about what we have planned for this summer here shortly and uh, turn it over to Grant. Hey, thank you so much, John. And I should mention to the audience um, to please, um, if you've got any questions that are not coming out of the call, please submit them in the chat and you can submit them for all panelists, whomever you would choose, and we will do our best to get to them. Um, Grant, I know uh, that this was an interesting time for Marietta City Schools as well. And, um, you know, everybody pulled out all the stops in this. Can you talk about uh, what you all did when COVID first hit? 
Sure. So, and thank you again. I appreciate the, the voice and the conversation you allow our community to have, and certainly I'm honored to join you. You know, John talked about a conviction, and I'll say in Marietta, we were having a conversation about a value statement. So on Friday, our kids, on Friday, March 13th, our kids walked into a building and could get breakfast and lunch, and that was their norm. And all because the school's closed on Monday, you know, the hunger doesn't stop and the need doesn't stop. So for us, I certainly respect um, a decision by any school district to have different locations where kids can come, but I gotta be honest with you, that's not good enough in Marietta. So in Marietta, our value statement was many children who go hungry also don't have access to transportation. And, and if their families are essential, essential workers and, and expected to work, they've got even less ability to get to a location to get food. So for us, it became a value statement that where we met the kids in the cafeteria before, we met them at a bus stop when we closed. So we created a plan that we launched the very next Monday that was 81 different bus stops across 18 different bus routes. We would need 225 volunteers a day in addition to transportation and, and, and um, nutrition staff to execute this plan. But over the course of 10 weeks, we delivered over 250,000 meals. And for us, it was about removing all barriers, all excuses, and all distance between our kids and food. So as we went across 81 different stops every single day, Monday to Friday, across 18 different bus routes that spread out across our entire community, we were gonna bring food within a couple blocks of where a child would get on a bus stop anyway. And for that, it was, about, it was about kids seeing yellow buses rolling through the city and knowing that we were there to care for them. And for us, just like our partnerships with, with MUS and the Y, I could tell you a story. Every weekend, we would push out an email to staff to see if we could fill 250 slots that were on a bus, handing food, you know, fit, making PB&Js, what have you. And I remember I, I, often I would get pushed back from staff because 200, 200 plus volunteer slots would initially fill within the first 10 to 15 minutes. And staff, if they weren't watching their email at a given time on a Sunday afternoon, would miss the chance to volunteer. So I'm really so proud of the value statement that Marietta made as we mobilized. And I can tell you that the need was obvious. I mean, I rode those buses. I handed out that food. And when you pull up to an apartment complex or pull up to a neighborhood and the kids see the buses coming and they run. I mean, I, 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 I was at an apartment complex where 80 kids converged on a bus and they ran like it was the first day or the last day of school. Listen, they didn't run to that bus when I pulled up to pick them up and normally take them to school. They ran to that bus because we were filling a vital need. So we served over 250,000 meals. Our buses would roll over 16,000 miles over the course of 10 weeks. And at the end of the day, it was just a commitment that like under our watch, no kid was going hungry. And under our watch, we weren't gonna wait on kids to come to us, we were going to them. And I think there were partnerships that we had, again, with the Y and with Must, or we were able to do things we just wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. But I'll tell you, for me and like for our Marietta community, it was about a value statement. I I am so proud to be a part of this community and to be able to work among folks like you and all that you are doing. Um, you know, whether we call it a conviction or a value statement, you all took care of your kids and you took care of our kids. And that is, um, we're just very blessed to be in this community. Becky, I know that the why um, and, and I can want to hear from you also, uh, but we'll start with Becky on, you know, what you all did. I know that you had food coming from the Atlanta Community Food Bank. And uh, can you talk about how you were partnering with the school system to make sure that that food got out as well? Yeah, sure. I think people um, so far have mentioned March 13th being that pivotal date where everything just kind of came to a screeching halt. And life as we knew it at the Y changed just a tad. And so, you know, our, this idea of being this fitness center and youth sports and swimming lessons, um, we quickly pivoted and uh, we've been in hunger relief, you know, but we were doing that when the school break was happening. And so feeding kids when school was out, that was what we were doing. So 16 weeks of the year. And so come March 13th, yeah, we had to double and triple down on what we were doing. And um, because of our longstanding relationship with Marietta City Schools and Cobb Schools, uh, we were able to uh, change. We had to, you know, we had all, we had a staff team that can now start packaging grocery bags for, for kiddos and families and load school buses with those bags and, and so that they can be distributed. And so we were able to provide the manpower for it. What first was 10,000 pounds of food that was coming every week 
to 20,000 pounds of food that was coming every week, um, both produce and shelf stable food. And so uh, we were very proud of that work and be able to support what Marietta City's needs were. But beyond that, um, also we were able to partner with the Atlanta Braves and they were, they had Food that they needed for the uh, to, to feed fans for the entire for the entire season, and so um, they were preparing family style meals that we were getting about 400 meals a week. Then that we can deliver to like Green Acres Elementary and Brumby Elementary, and so families were able not to not only get food that needed to be prepared, but this was you know a throw in the oven kind of family style meal that they were able to get and. Um, but then beyond the kids, you know, we, there was a huge need with our seniors. You know, we have so many seniors in Cobb that um, really felt isolated, you know, when kind of all their social networks were, were kind of ending. And so um, Operation Meal Plan that the chamber quickly was able to mobilize and work with restaurants whose business also came to a screeching halt. Um, again, we were able to distribute those um, to seniors. They can drive through, get a hot meal for the night, and um, take, and go home, and then also see some, you know, familiar faces um, while they were safely in their car. So I, I, you know, just just like the schools, and I'm sure must um, we, yes, we quickly had to, you know, stop what we were doing, um, and then totally pivot into this other space of being. Um, in the food distribution, you know, work. And then also childcare, you know, Grant mentioned families still had to work. We had workers who still had to get to the grocery stores and, and provide medical uh, care. And so one YMCA here in Cobb was your, was your essential childcare facility. And so we had kids still coming every day so that their parents could go and provide work on those front lines. And then your Northeast Cobb Y was a big, huge fit food distribution hub. And so um, I think it I'm very proud of the work that we did, but also it was because of those longstanding partnerships that when this happened, people thought, oh, we can, we can use the Y. They have the staff, they have the space. Um, let's, let's see if we can make this happen. So super proud of that. And Becky, one thing that continues to floor me is that you did all of this with hardly any volunteers. Right. Yeah, I mean, your staff were wearing multiple, <laughs> multiple, multiple. Yes, yes. Team office. director, wellness director, everyone moved into the food distribution work. And so definitely one, you know, shifted yeah, yeah. from one Friday to that Monday um, and, and so willing to do so to meet this need. So very proud of them. You know, I think when all this is said and done, the word pivot needs to be stricken from the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> we, we use it as a drinking game now in all of our Zoom. <laughs> Every time someone says pivot, you, you drink your water that you have in your hand. Yes. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, hey, I, I know that that was also a real challenge for you, not having uh, volunteers. Can you tell us um, how you all were involved with all this and how you made it work with a reduced number of volunteers? I, I sure will. When things were normal on March the 12th, uh, <laughs> back when times were normal, uh, we, we started making a decision uh, to pirouette uh, on March the 13th as everything changed by uh, realizing that our 17,000 volunteers that we had the past year were not going to be available to us. And so normally what we do at MUST is we do four things. Uh, we help to get people clothing. We help to get people jobs. Uh, we help people with housing and we help people with food. And we immediately realized the enormity of what we were facing, uh, especially when we were on calls with Marietta City Schools and Cobb County Schools. And uh, we were hearing from them because they were our subject matter experts. We just felt like they're going to know something before we do. So we were very fortunate that they included us uh, in their loop to be able to hear what was going on in real time. So we made the decision, Sherry, we were gonna only focus on two things. Uh, we were gonna focus on housing, we were gonna focus on food. And imagine with the housing, how vulnerable our population is. And these people are normally there from 30 to 35 days. We have 72 beds. Uh, we'll have anywhere between 13 and 18 children uh, that are uh, uh, in addition to uh, those numbers of 72 beds. And so you're sitting there with around 85 people and now you've got a pandemic that's going on. So we made the decision that we were going to freeze 
the people who were there inside of the shelter because they didn't have a place to be able to go. So they couldn't just exit after 30 days. Uh, everyone was gonna be frightened of that taking place. And so we started using hotel and motel vouchers. And uh, during that period of time, up until this week, uh, we've had 187 heads of households uh, that have been put into hotels. I, I know one particular statistic that I saw, John, was uh, nine families from Cobb County schools that have been uh, referred over to us. So there's been a lot of people who've been placed into hotel motels. Very thankful for our partnerships uh, with churches uh, that provide a lot of that money for us to be able to go to work in that area. And so it was in that area, and then it was going to be in food. And uh, of course, on a, a normal basis, March the 12th, we had 39 pantries in schools, one at KSU, uh, a couple up in Cherokee County, and the rest are uh, Marietta City, three pantries there, and then the rest are in Cobb County schools. Normally, in Cobb County and Marietta, we're serving 400 families a month through that program. Well, immediately, uh, there was an explosion there. Uh, because uh, all of a sudden we were serving four and five times that number, and it's continued to be in that area. Uh, a quick snapshot of the way you could look at it as must is that in a normal year, we'll serve around 33 to 35,000 people in a normal year. From March the 13th, uh, extrapolated down to June 17th, there's going to be over 50,000 people in just one area and that being in the area of food that we're helping to take care of. So we have those 39 pantries that we're operating, and then suddenly with the schools closing, then we were losing those locations. So they were gracious enough to let us go in and raid our food pantries, take that food, and then begin to distribute it to families. In addition to the normal route of the 400 families being fed through the pantry program, we also, at our standalone pantries, three of those, one in Cherokee, two in Cobb, we normally feed 1,100 families a month there. So all together, in a normal month, there would have been 1,500 families. Uh, we've had months where we've been right at 6,000 families and more uh, that we're taking care of. And we're very fortunate because MUST is about to enter its 50th year of uh, being in our community and there's a high level of trust that people established that name long before I ever got there. And because of that good name, there's been a lot of people who have given to us. And so uh, the irony was uh, we were flush with cash at a point to be able to do this type of work, designated funds for feeding, but it was getting harder and harder uh, to be able to get food. And, and we are a part of the Atlanta Community Food Bank and very, very thankful for them but their selection is not very broad. It goes deep, but not as broad. And normally we supplement that through Sam's, uh, Costco, Publix, Kroger, all those great partners, but they were having problems with um, their supply chain. So that was interrupting our service. Um, and so getting, getting food in became crucial for us to just turn around and to be able to get it out. Um, we also were fortunate that an organization, uh, a company called Gate Gourmet, uh, came uh, into our orbit, and they started providing 1,200 meals a week that we were able to serve to our outreach clients. So outreach clients are people who do not come into our shelter. They're the ones that are the most vulnerable. Uh, they're the ones that sleep in the woods, sleep under the viaducts and doorways, places like that, and we saw those numbers quadruple almost immediately. We feel like those numbers are going to get higher as the unemployment benefits begin to run out. We see the next tsunami being in housing, so we're already stamping and working to that and knowing we're going to need more money for hotel and motel vouchers and praying that a lot of that funding comes along. People like CFR, uh, some of the other great organizations, Live Safe, that are operating in that space, there's been a lot of emphasis on food money, 
but not as much on how are you going to house people. So we see that as a tsunami. And then we're already projecting out what do we do about workforce development because we feel like there's going to be another huge wave there uh, where we can be a part of the solution. So we're trying to look at those as opportunities in the midst of those challenges uh, where we can continue to meet the needs uh, of our community. But uh, Sherry, you've got a couple of slides there. Um, I think that you can, maybe you can show for me. Yeah, and if you can, can uh, statistics sometimes takes my emotions out of it. And, and Grant, that means uh, for a preacher and John, you start stretching the numbers. Uh, so I actually had somebody uh, under control who could share those with us. Could you pull them up, Sherry? I am, I think, did I just get that? There you go. Yeah, you uh, pull them up. I can see them right now. Okay. And if you can so kind of scroll it for us. I will. There we go. So you can see, and it's just a comparison between 2019 and 2020, that households served in 2020 was 14,483, whereas in 2019, it's that 5,000. So the green number is the difference going up. So 9,400 uh, additional households being served, and then members within the household uh, going from 12,000 to 26, and meals provided uh, you know, up to the 335,000, and then the total pounds of food. And then I think there's one additional slide. Yes. And this is, this is just giving you uh, an idea here of how many meals and the different things uh, that we're doing. And you can, you can see what a difference, uh, you know, uh, those months have made. So uh, as we, can, we continue with it, of course, then we, we had summer lunch coming, and I know you're going to be getting to that. And let me also update you that um, I spoke yesterday with Kay Kirkpatrick, our Senator from East Cobb. She's the one that's been pushing what we call the SOS bill, which is Save Our Sandwiches. It's uh, Senate Bill 345. And that I went down and spoke uh, before the Health and Human Services, both on the Senate and the House side, uh, explaining uh, why, why we would like to see uh, some things loosened when it comes to being able to feed children. And that's now in the House Rules Committee. And uh, they're hoping that it's going to come out uh, for a full vote. It was unanimously passed in both sessions that I went to with those different groups. And Kay Kirkpatrick has done a great job on that Senate side and Burt Reeves on the House side of pushing that bill. And we thought last year when we found out that we couldn't serve homemade sandwiches, we thought that turned our apple cart upside yeah. down. We had no idea what it was going to hold, or we would have just said, not a problem. We, we got no. it under control. That was a $250,000 issue. And I'll tell you what we're doing in summer lunch uh, whenever Sherry wants us to. Okay. Well, and I hope we can get to everything we want to talk about. I do want to um, um, transfer to a question that someone asked. Is there any discussion? And this is uh, for Grant and John, any discussion about revisiting the free and reduced uh, lunch push anytime other than the start of the school year? And uh, Grant and John, you're right. John will be in. So I can tell you in Marietta, it's year round. So, okay. um, so for example, last spring, you know, a year ago, um, we, there was a major push for us to try to get our, free, our, our, our lunch forms filled out, our free and reduced lunch forms completed. So I can tell you that as far as our perspective goes, our goal is to get um, anytime there's an interaction between a caring adult who has a reason to be in a conversation with a family, um, we're going to encourage them to fill out that form. Um, for us, it's a year round process because there's year round need. That's great. Hey, John, how's that work at Cobb? Yeah, just quickly, just to echo that, obviously, if the, year, if the needs are daily, then the resource should be daily. It's not, there's no deadline on August 3rd that if you don't fill out the form or else, there are lots of barriers we talked about earlier that are uh, social, personal, and otherwise, we try to do as much as we can to get the processes out of the way. Hey, if you have a need, we're going to get you uh, what you need as, as uh, easily as possible. To Grant's point, it's a year-round process in any school in Cobb County. That's great. Um, this is all such a great conversation. I wish we could go on for forever, but I do want to be sure that we have within the five minutes we have left, 
Grant, could you take just a minute and say where folks can go to find out where um, they can get summer lunches? John, the same thing. Um, and Becky and I, um, I've got one final question for the two of you, and I hope we get to it. We'll see. Grant? Yeah, I'll just say briefly. So listen, we're on track right now to serve over 100,000 meals um, across a variety of community partners, all of which is made possible in part by the Y, by Must, by people like Becky and Ike. So uh, I would encourage anyone, uh, Marion City Schools has a, um, has a link on our main page that has all the information relative to summer resources, be it academic or food related or other. So please check that out as it pertains to our school district. But I just want to say briefly, and I, you know, we're not only do we have different sites set up um, around the community, but again, thanks to Ike and, and, and others, and certainly Becky as well, we're actually continuing food delivery up and down Franklin Road. So um, I, it's just important as we serve many, many meals this summer that we get those in the hands of most deserving families. Thank you. Hey, John, what about Cobb Schools? Yeah, similarly, we're extending our uh, food, food distribution that we've grown accustomed to throughout the course of the spring that has served, as I mentioned earlier, uh, almost 400,000 meals throughout the spring into the summer. That'll be available at eight sites spread throughout Cobb County. You can find specific dates, locations at wwwcobk 12 backslash COVID, along with anything else COVID related. Um, and uh, just one other thought on that, you know, for each of the panelists here, you're hearing about the end result and you're hearing numbers and, and ultimately everything goes back to need. And mm -hmm. I think consistently as it relates to the summer, you know, we, we frankly don't have it all figured out in terms of the logistics and the money and all we know is we're doing it. And I think that goes for each of the organizations here. Each of the organizations met the need when the needs arose. And that just speaks to the boards, to the leadership inside of each of these organizations. And um, I think it's an important point to make. We're, we're all rebuilding the plane as, as we're flying it. And, uh, but our commitment in Cobb, and I think certainly from these organizations, is that we will meet the needs as they continue throughout the course of the summer. Thank you so much for that. And I so wish that we had much more time, but we are at the end. And one thing that I definitely want to um, say to everyone, first, thank you for all that you are doing. And I think everyone who is on this panel um, would, would be the first to say that we've got two core organizations here with YMCA and MUST who are integrally involved in this, but it is a group effort that is going far beyond. We've got churches who are providing their facilities. We have uh, the churches who are providing their volunteers, you know, multiple organizations who are sharing food and reaching out to one another. And um, it's just, in, you know, we say it takes a village, it, it, it takes a county. <laughs> it doesn't take just a village, it takes a county, and then some. Um, so thank you all so much for participating today. Thank you to our guests who participated, um, those who attended and participated in um, our polls. Um, you will receive an email or you'll be triggered right after to um, give us some feedback on this and let us know what you'd like to hear about next time. Um, Grant, John, Becky, I thank you for being a part of this. Thank you for sharing with everyone what you're doing. Um, you all help to make this community what it is. And we just thank you for taking care of your kids and our kids the way that you do. So with that, if there's anything that Cobb Community Foundation can do to help you with your giving, please give us a call. Um, we are answering the phones and we look forward to helping you make an impact. Have a great day and a great weekend. Bye everybody. Bye.